When it comes to fitness, there are oftentimes things people do that stop their progress. In other words, oftentimes it's more about the wrong things people do rather than the right things that they're not doing. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the five worst fitness mistakes people make that damage your health and your longevity. Stop doing these. Yeah. I think it's important first for you to know uh, or define, I guess, like uh what it looks like to be training for health and longevity first versus like uh, maybe a performance goal or to build the most amount of muscle or to, or do you think that that aligns still? Do you think the same? No. Yeah, it's different, and, right? No, I mean, um, you know, what was it? Who was it that showed us that Venn Jason. diagram? Was it? Yeah. yeah, it was like longevity. Uh, it was over here and performance, performance is over here. Aesthetic. Um, and the, the further you go towards performance, the more you take away from longevity. So now for the average person listening, this doesn't, this isn't really that important, but if you look at uh, like hardcore fitness fanatics, for example, if you look at like the, the, the best endurance athletes in the world or the strongest power lifters or strength, you know, um, athletes in the world or the, you know, professional level of sports, what you'll see is they actually have worse longevity than a just somebody who's really healthy and lives in, in the regular world. And that's because when you start to pursue those extremes, you start to trade uh, longevity for performance. I, I think the average person, though, hears that. They're not going <laughs> to – it's like, just work out. You know what I mean? Just well, I mean, the reason why I bring that up is because I, I feel like the people that are communicating to the most amount of people are some of these extreme – Yeah. Good fitness point. influencer people that are communicating to the average person who's following them because they they admire their their physique or they like their personality mm -hmm. online or whatever and they're taking health and fitness advice from this ex extreme kind of athlete i mean even though they may not seem extreme they probably are as in regards to diet and consistency yes. and training volume and intensity yeah. And when I think of health and longevity, it looks right. And, and the reason why I feel this is so important is I've even been struggled. I've struggled with this, right? I remember not that long ago, I kind of had this moment where I started to even question the the way I was training and what was what I training for, right? Like it was very clear when I had a, a goal in mind of like competing, getting on stage or trying to get better at a sport or whatever. Um, but where I'm at in my life now, it's, it's more about, playing with my son and and being a, a healthy mobile strong dad it l definitely looks more longevity focused but then i still have some of these old patterns and behaviors that are more you know muscle building yeah. focused and yeah. it's like where is is getting my deadlift to 600 pounds going to really a, a, a benefit me in the long a, sure. the pursuit of longevity no right? i think what you're saying is uh is important to note because in fact, as we go through the five worst fitness mistakes, uh, many of them are a result of the communication that we're getting from extreme fitness fanatics. Many mm -hmm. of these mistakes are because we get the messaging we get are from people who are not uh, maximizing health and longevity, but rather, you know, either genetic anomaly, anomalies or super obsessed and have been for, you know, most of their lives. And so the, the, the information they're putting out probably is playing a role and some of these huge uh, fitness mistakes that we're going to talk about today. And, and as we go through these, uh, you know, it's very clear as we go through these, it became very clear to me as, as I wrote them down that these probably have more to do with the reason why people aren't able to accomplish their health goals and fitness goals than it's pretty close to the, to, uh, the fact that people just don't even try. Like that's got to be number one. People don't even try. Right. Mm -hmm. But then second place easily is that people try and then they do, they make these mistakes that set them back so far in many cases, uh, having them never try again. Mm -hmm. So then they become part of that category. In fact, if you look at, totally agree, you look at the data yeah. on, um, you know, pe people who don't work out, you know, if you've never worked out, there's a certain percentage odd that you'll try at some point. If you've worked out many times and failed many times, the worst the failure is, like if you got injured or mm -hmm. got sick or whatever, the odds you'll ever try again or start to dim diminish every single try yeah. because you failed every single time. Yeah, and a lot of times you see it's too hard, too fast. Uh, you know, 
and then you're too hopeful that like you're gonna get these quick results and so you, you take on just way too much in the yep. very beginning which um the the right approach is 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 really like how can i keep coming back and what's that look like and uh th this is very common um because momentum is plays such a huge factor in that initial spark uh to begin with you you want to ride this momentum that you're yes. feeling and it's a big feeling that you're going to accomplish so many things and so i i want to see how many things i can stack as wins all at once which inevitably just ends up in disaster now i'm glad you said that and you highlighted the importance of you know momentum and how we start because when I look at the list that you made, and I think, you know, there, there's a majority, of, obviously everybody I think is going to benefit from this, but you're going to have some people that think, oh, this isn't for me. I'm not, a, well, I'm a young guy who wants to build lots of muscle. That's all I care about. As I got further into my career, I realized that no matter what their goal was, whether they were trying to lose a hundred pounds, uh, play a sport, build 50 pounds of muscle, compete for a show. Mm -hmm. This was how I wanted them to start. Like we needed to start on the health and longevity path first mm -hmm. because all other pursuits uh, only get more difficult or less likely for us to succeed at if I haven't first figured out- Where's home to, base? You have to start there. Where's yeah, I have to teach them how to be healthy and live better and do that consistently. And then from there you can jump and off. Build and build momentum. Yeah. yeah, and then we can stack on our performance goals. We can stack on our aesthetic goals. We can stack sure. on these uh, you know, individual things that you want to accomplish that start to maybe move a little bit away from health and longevity, but are still in the world but or the realm. you won't get there without the, without the stepping stone yes. of health and longevity. And, and the, the, you know, here's the other side of that, is if we took the average person, the vast majority of the population, and just got them healthy, their aesthetics and performance oh, yeah. would dramatically improve Coincides because with that. it's baked into the recipe. It's all baked into the recipe. It's actually one of my favorite things that you've communicated on the podcast. In fact, I just saw a, another trainer, a decent following too, sharing our content. I don't know if I shared it with you guys or not, but he was sharing that as like one of the most profound things that uh, that had like basically resonated with him. He'd been a coach and trainer for a long time and in really good shape. And he's like, oh my God, like, you know, Sal from Mind Pump made this comment about, you know, chasing health and aesthetics will follow. And he goes this whole time, yeah. even as a trainer, I've been so focused, you know, on my aesthetics and eating that way. And it's, you know, stressful and challenging and I'm good at it sometimes. I'm not so good at it versus approaching it with this idea of I'm going to try and be a healthier version of myself and always continue to improve that. And the irony of the aesthetics tend to follow that. That's right. Know? Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. So the first big mistake is that people are just not consistent on a daily basis with movement, just movement. At some point in the health space, we thought that movement only counted if it was a workout. Like you had to go do something, yeah, break a sweat, work out. Like, yeah, oh, you, you struggle. go for a run or go for a swim or go work out or go do this thing. Otherwise it doesn't count. This is terrible information because A, it's first off, it's not true. So that already makes it terrible information, but two, it devalued one of the most valuable things that we find in all the data mm -hmm. for longevity, which is just move every day, move throughout the day, every single day. The healthiest populations are populations of people where you know movement is is literally you know, baked into their daily existence. So the advice that you would sometimes hear and scoff at, like park your car further away from your destination. Take, the, Take stairs the stairs instead of the yeah. elevator, right? Stand instead of sit while you're working on this thing or, you know, go for walks throughout the day. You know, the fitness space, the industry of the fit, the fitness industry itself came in and somehow made that seem like that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. You really got to go do this crazy workout. Otherwise, it doesn't count. This is terrible. Nothing can be further from the truth. The average person who's inactive would see dramatic. They're not going to become ripped. They're not going to whatever. But they'll lose some weight probably they get more fit but really their health will improve dramatically just from moving more 
yeah. every single day. Well, I mean, just think of that stark contrast of sitting down, uh, continuously sitting on the couch, uh, sitting at your desk at work, and then all of a sudden wanting to do like a high intense workout and being that's the new standard I have to achieve. Uh, every time I go to the gym is this high intensity workout. And, you know, in, in terms of that being the bridge of like, I just want to get up and walk and I want to get up and, and add more movement throughout my day. And what that's going to do is it's going to supercharge your energy. It's going to make you more likely to want to just move around and do things and be more active, which will promote, uh, you know, further steps where we can add some uh, resistance to that and really get into the workout aspect of it. But a lot of times we just have this tendency to just jump into something that's like way too hard, too fast, uh, where there's, there's steps in between that will, uh, you know, allow for you to uh, set yourself up for more consistency. I love this being the first point because not only did I get this terribly wrong when I first started, but it also became the first thing that I would start to recommend to people going forward after I learned, right? So initially, I would fall in the category of the dumb trainer that scoffed at this when someone would say that they walk for their exercise. And then later, it became the way I would coach someone. So even if they were highly motivated to go in the gym five days a week, they're willing to do this or willing to do that, I'd say, listen, this is what I want to start with. I just want you to start with every day uh, after dinner, go for a 20 minute walk. And I would just, I would prescribe a act, a walking, a small walk paired with something that I knew they were already doing every day and wanted them to uh, encourage them to yep. not only just start that, but also get a sense of like how, to your point, how much better they just started to feel because they were moving more, how easy it was to commit to that. So I could start to stack some wins. Like, it's so funny that this was something that I, I scoffed at. Then it turned into the number one piece of first advice that I would give to clients because you also have to keep in mind that these people that we're trying to help, part of that process, back to your point, Justin, is consistency and being able to maintain this forever. I mean, almost any of us can sacrifice or discipline or power through 30 days of torture or crazy, not sleeping a lot, working extra hard. Yeah. But to sustain that forever is not realistic. And so when we build in these things into people's lifestyle, as good coaches and trainers, we always have to be thinking like, okay, I know this person's highly motivated because they want to lose all this weight right now, but I also got to be thinking like, what are these things that I can give to them that they can they can actually start to build into their life and then keep in their life forever? And that is why this is such an important one that so many people miss because it's an it's a easy way to impact people positively with their health with very little commitment and very little effort. You don't need effort. to change clothes. You just move throughout the day. Just be active throughout the day. Insert it into your daily life. By the way, the data on this is, is remarkable. I mean, there's a st strong connection between the less you move, the the, the worse your health the worse is. worse your health is. It turns out not moving uh, is just bad for you across the board. I mean, it's the only time in human history, recorded human history, the only times you didn't move a lot was when you were sick. Mm -hmm. There were no other times where if you didn't move a lot, except for maybe the occasional Sabbath or whatever you like, you moved daily a lot. Every system in your body benefits from That's movement, right. especially your mind. You know, yes. the, the, the mood boosting effects or the antidepressant, anti-anxiety effects of daily activity are, are pronounced. They actually happen pretty quickly too. Mm -hmm. So you just feel better um, as a result. The next one is, uh, especially when we're talking about longevity health, is that uh, people don't lift weights. They think the best types of workouts for longevity um, typically involve cardio or cardiovascular style training or, or something along those lines. Strength training was never considered for longevity. Now, for a long time, strength training or lifting weights uh, was considered essential for performance. Uh, if you want to be uh, a faster athlete, a stronger, definitely a stronger athlete, then you lifted weights. We also knew that strength training sh changed the way you looked uh, as evidenced by the extreme, you know, look of bodybuilders. But really it's, it was never a conversation um, when it comes to longevity. In fact, look, you know, mm -hmm. I've been in this for two and a half decades, but it isn't, it hasn't been discussed as a longevity form of exercise until, I mean, a lot of it until the last five years, even 10 years ago when we started the podcast, 
nobody was really talking about lifting weights as a way to improve your longevity and health, or at least not as a superior form. Well, here's what the data shows now. Not only is strength training or lifting weights uh, a good form of exercise for longevity, it turns out it's the best. Mm -hmm. It turns out when it comes to scheduled workouts, nothing is more effective at improving the quality of your life and longevity, the length of your life, like lifting weights. And there's a, there's a few reasons why. One is it teaches your body to burn more calories. This is great. So now eating more food doesn't necessarily hurt you as badly. So there's that part. But more importantly, when it comes to metabolic health, muscles metabolically healthy mm -hmm. or active, I should say, it's very hormone sensitive, especially insulin. We all know what insulin resistance uh, does to the body. Um, and then most importantly, nobody considers this. This is a big deal, by the way. Look at the data on this. Mobility. Your ability to move and yep. function and take care of yourself is very strongly connected to your longevity. And live pain-free. And if you don't lift weights, okay, if you don't lift weights, if you don't strength train, there is a significant percentage of muscle that you will lose every decade you're alive after, I think, the age of 30 or 40. Like it, 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 and it compounds. So if your goal is to be healthy uh, and have longevity, you, you better lift weights. It's like one of the most important forms of exercise. So it's interesting you went that way with this point because when you had written this point down, my brain went a little bit different direction. And not, I mean, everything you just said is 100% on point. But what I was thinking when you made this point about the like the you know five worst mistakes that people make in regards to this is how how badly we communicated lifting weights specifically for health and longevity. Totally. Uh, there's this misconception that, you know, if you're a gym person, I remember my buddy, one of my buddies said this to me not that long, only about 10 years ago when he said this to me. And uh, obviously I'm deep into my career by that time. And, you know, I'm caring about my buddies getting older and like asking what he's like, man, I don't want to seven days a week, an hour to two hours in the gym. I don't, I don't, I don't want to look like you that bad to where I would do that. I'm just like, wow, that's uh, the, this idea that, you know, you either, uh, don't go to the gym, or if you go to the gym, you're a gym rat in mm -hmm. order to... Right. Yeah, there's no in between. Yeah, there's not like a, like, what do, what does lifting weights for health, healthy and fit people? It's like either nothing or bodybuilder is the no, goal. No, yeah. it's, no. I'm serious. It's I like, know, that's, that's, the that's the perception. You're right. That's a lot of, that's what a lot of the general population thinks. They, they look at people that go to the gym like crazy. They look like bodybuilders, and either you want to look like that or you don't, and if you yeah. don't want to look like that, then eh, why am I using, why lift weights? I'd rather run, or I'd rather right. swim, or I'd rather yeah, do these because they're other. comparing physiques of like uh, extreme people. Example. Yeah, yes. but they know, and so, yeah, that's why like running, walking has been promoted so much as a longevity activity. Uh, it's, because, it's relatable. It's more relatable. That looks really unrelatable, the bodybuilder uh, type of physique with that, but in it's so crazy because I mean, in terms of longevity, you know, lifting weights and building muscle, like it's it's not just like it it, it keeps you strong. Uh, it also is protective with your joints in terms of pain, but it's also protective. It, you become even more resilient against things like illness. You know, illness, yeah. And it, it it's so interesting to see how you know just internally how protective like muscle is and, and how crucial that is for the longevity of your lifespan. And finishing the point that I was heading towards is the the amount of volume intensity and stuff you have to do to achieve that is so minimal yeah like i'm to even, get longevity benefits right. to get longevity benefits once a week yeah, yeah. <laughs> one hour not or crazy. two hours of lifting weights moderately not crazy not no. trying to break yourself off not doing crazy crossfit workouts or some circuit class but picking a handful of some of the best compound lifts, practicing it like a skill and getting good at it, getting good at it one to three hours out of the week total, and you get Covered. profound health and longevity benefits. Yes. And that is just not communicated. No. It is either or. You are either somebody who doesn't identify as a bodybuilder, so lifting these weights seven days a week, two hours a day is too much for me. I don't want to do that. And I'm going to go down this path or I, I want to be that way. Therefore, I have to do all. So it's like, no, it's crazy what effort has to be put. To, and I think that if more people, uh, normal people, people that aren't, don't admire bodies and physiques and bodybuilding, people that just want to be healthy, they don't want to be sick. They just want to not have pain. If they knew how little they had to do in the gym in order to obtain 
that best version of what they w- would envision themselves as, it's unbelievable how 99% of my clients strength trained or lifted weights one to two days a week. 99%. And these were the people who, everyday people, fit and healthy. They definitely want to look good, but they don't want to be shredded. They didn't care about that. They just wanted to improve their health. No, So if you're active every day, you're moving every day, and you want to add a workout where you actually take time in your day to work out, like you just... You'll lift weights and it's going to give you more for the time spent than any other form of exercise. In fact, it'll give you more for the two times uh, of amount of time spent than other forms of exercise. That's how effective lifting weights or strength training is. And the people that need to hear this, uh, when we're talking about health and longevity, you tend to, it, it tends to be people 50 and older or 45 and older, unfortunately came from a generation that where this is not communicated whatsoever. Like when I tell a 60 year old, we got to lift weights uh, to improve your health and longevity. They look at me like, can we pick another form of exercise? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to do that. Yeah, Turned scary. out most of my clients were the age group yeah. uh, towards the end of my career. Right. And they got, you know, of course, the best results. The next mistake, this is a big one. that this is, Now, this mistake is typically made early on. So somebody's like, that's it. I'm going to start working out. Yeah, this big mistake is that you do too much. The value of workouts. Uh, so we talked about just moving throughout the day. But actual workouts. The value of a workout is in the adaptation that occurs post-workout, not in the workout itself. The workout itself just serves as a way to signal the adaptation you're looking for. So you go to the gym, you work out. It's a stress. It causes some damage. That's why it's hard and it hurts. That's why you get a little sore sometimes. And then the body goes, okay, let's heal and let's also overcompensate a little bit. Let's adapt so that next time if this happens again, this is how your body is designed. If it happens again, it's not going to cause as much damage. So you get a little stronger, a little more fit. If you overcome your body's ability to heal and adapt, which is when you're a beginner, easy, Mm -hmm. very easy to do. I could take a deconditioned individual and overtrain them in 20 minutes, um, literally. If if you do too much beyond that, then you're not getting, you're not going to tap into that adaptation. You're just going to heal. You're going to damage and heal, damage and heal, damage and heal. And this is why, if you've ever experienced this, you, you you did too much all at once and you didn't get a lot of results. You plateaued real hard, real quickly, and then you started feeling tired and burnt out. You lost all motivation. You stopped. Now, of all, all the points that you wrote, this was the one to me that uh, stood out as like, this is across the board. It doesn't matter if it's health and longevity. It doesn't matter if it's for sports. It doesn't matter if it's yeah. for fat loss. We all, we tend to, and we I think we communicate the hell out of this on the podcast, we tend to think that more is better because it serves us in most everything else. And in in this in this scenario or in any scenario related to getting to your fitness and health goals, the goal is actually to do the least amount possible to elicit the most amount of change. Which, which I need to which which simultaneously is the perfect amount. I want to say that. Yes. It's the perfect amount. It is. It is the most ideal and the fastest way you to get there. That's the part that people have to wrap their brain around. The goal is to do the least amount possible that elicits the most amount of change, and that is the fastest way to get to whatever said goal is. I don't care if it's performance. I don't care if it's longevity. I don't care if it's building muscle. I don't care if it's burning body fat, but that is how the body adapts and works. And if you throw more than that at it, you will only slow down your progress or potentially completely hinder it. So you have to understand that. And I think in this case, because we have over communicated intensity and beast mode and motivation stuff and hype is so centered around the fitness space that these people that come into the gym, whatever their goal may be, tend to almost always overdo it. Yep. Because to your point, if you were doing literally nothing for your fitness goal, this is also why, by the way, walking became the first goal. If I got somebody mm-hmm. who was like the average American, couch potato, not eating well, not doing anything, walking is the least amount possible to elicit some change. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's literally telling yeah. them to just go walk every day for 20 to 30 minutes, I'm going to start moving them towards health and longevity in a very nice pace. And then if I added one or two days... The full body workouts. I mean, I'm 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 about maxing out on what I should do for that person to get the most results, mm-hmm. the fastest and the safest, and the most sustainable for that person. And I just think that 
this is one that m- most all people uh, make a mistake here for sure. A hundred percent. And, you know, mentioning like one day of strength training a week and moving regularly throughout the week, people think, well, how far is that going to get you? Hmm. There's a lot you can do in a one in one workout. There, it's not like you're doing the same workout uh, once a week. You start very easy in the intensity and the resistance increase and improve. This is why I was able to train people for 10 years mm-hmm. and they would only lift weights once or twice a week. And it, we started that way and that's how we ended. There's a lot you can do within that. Well, and not only that, I mean, you use Doug a lot as this example. You have a guy who's been lifting for decades already and he achieved his best physique in what, two days two a week? Two days a week with me. Mm-hmm. Two days, and, and he wasn't like just going for longevity and health. The guy's ripping 400 pounds off the floor and he's shredded in abs. Yeah. And so with two days a week. Right. So if if his if he had came to you and said, hey, I don't really need, I, I mean, he wanted to build muscle. He wanted yeah. to get strong. But if he just said, hey, I just want to be healthy, Sal. Shit. I mean, one day a week would have gotten totally. to that just fine. Yeah, I mean, oh. even if like, let's just say a scenario where somebody has like a labor intensive job. Uh, but you know, their idea that I'm going to be able to now be healthy and get in good shape and all this is to now uh, approach these crazy, you know, workouts on top of what I'm already doing. When in fact, them actually getting more rest and recovery would probably move their needle like so much further, you know, from the very beginning. So it's, I think there's, there's quite a disconnect there in terms of like what the workout, uh, like what it's intention, what what it's actually doing, and what we're doing is we're stressing the body just that perfect amount, so that way we can go back and we can build yes. upon that. I'm glad you said that because, or you you emphasize that because someone may think, um, if this much is going to get me this far, more will get me farther, and I don't care if it's less efficient. Every time I push harder, I'm still going to get closer to my goal and faster. No, 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 actually. Going this far is perfect. Anything beyond that makes you move less. <laughs> so yeah, yep. that's literally how it works, which takes us to the next point, which is, um, this is a big mistake, valuing calorie burn of activity. This is a completely worthless statistic, completely worthless. Now, that doesn't mean there's no value in the in how the body's metabolizing, utilizing energy. There's health benefits to that, obviously. But looking at forms of exercise and then ranking them in order of how many calories I burn while I'm doing it is a is a terrible, terrible, dumb mistake. Because number one, it means almost nothing. It means almost nothing. The calories you burn with a hard workout uh, are almost inconsequential for a couple of different reasons. One, super easy to replace those calories with food. But really, the big one is two, your body adapts to that very quickly, very, very quickly. Um, and then it's not, it not only it went from low value to almost zero value. And then the last reason, the biggest reason why this is terrible is you end up ignoring the variable or the factor that is most important, which is what's the adaptation I'm after? What am mm-hmm. I looking for? Am I looking for endurance? Am I looking for strength? Am I looking for mobility? Am I looking for a faster metabolism? Then you pick from there what form of exercise you're going to use. The calorie burn means nothing, zero. And when people value this, what they tend to do is choose the highest cal. They look it up on the internet. What form of exercise burns the most calories in 30 minutes? Cool. That's, let me do that one. And they get terrible results because it doesn't mean anything. I blame our doctors and our medical system for this one. I really think that they oversimplified the law of thermodynamics to the average patient. Uh, weight loss. Because yep. they know that the the average American is overweight. A large percentage are obese. Mm. Uh, obviously, that is from simple math. There's a whole host of reasons and behaviors and psychological stuff that goes into that. But the scientific reason why those people are overweight is because they don't move enough for the amount of calories yep. that they eat. Yep. So the simple answer and equation to that is move more, burn more. I don't have yeah. to tell them anything about their diet, and then that will improve their health more. <laughs> We're not going to discern uh, the actual tissue, whether it's muscle or fat, and like none of that is is going to matter. This is where to the whole BMI, yep. uh, you know, came as a result of that. So yeah, I'm on board with that. That's and we have to do a better job of communicating this that that. That really does matter. That's why that's why I blame the medical system and doctors first because they they started that narrative and then the trainers that looked up to the the doctors rightfully so uh, took that advice and then brought it into the gyms 
and have continued to communicate that. And I and the pendulum is just barely starting to swing back the other yeah. direction. And we're starting to get smarter coaches and trainers. We're getting a lot better doctors. Now you're seeing a lot more doctors that understand the value. I mean, that was ne that was unheard of just 10 years ago. 10 oh. years ago, I would never hear a doctor recommend strength training. You're actually hearing that now. I know lots of d doctor friends of ours yeah. that have your book and recommend it to people and stuff like that. And I think that it's it's starting to swing back, but it definitely came from there, and it was definitely perpetuated by us trainers that didn't know better, and that and unfortunately the general population still hasn't heard the right messaging long enough that the the form of exercise you're chasing is not the one that burns the most calorie right now. It is the one that is going to build your metabolism more than anything else. That is what's going to set you up for the most success and the most fat loss. Yeah, and again, just to look at the data. First off, the data on weight loss through exercise alone is dismal. It's the worst stat strategy you could, you could uh, go into to try to lose uh, weight. But then if you look at exercise, okay, they have done this now. They've compared forms of exercise for pure fat loss and strength training um, is superior, superior at, at burning pure body fat. And the reason is because it preserves muscle, whereas other forms of exercise tend to cause uh, muscle loss as well. So it's 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 head and shoulders above uh, the rest. And the reason why I, I, we're emphasizing strength training here is because if we were to value calorie burn, guess where strength training would be? <laughs> it's at very the low, bottom. Very low. Right. Like traditional weightlifting, okay? Not with the, rest periods. Yeah, yeah, not the yeah. fake weightlifting. Let's circuit, basically cardio. You're doing a class, you're just holding dumbbells. That's not strength training. The strength training I'm that not we're talking get a lot about, of splat points for the, that. The, the kind that converts, that, that really, really uh, improves longevity and health, okay, is traditional uh, strength training, traditional lifting weights. You do a set. You rest for two or three minutes. You do a set. You rest for two or three minutes. It burns very little calories in comparison to other forms of exercise. So if it were about the calorie burn, you would not see that be the most effective form of exercise for fat loss and longevity. And yet there it is. So don't look at the calorie burn. Think of the adaptation. That's the most important thing. Sorry to interrupt you. Right now, MAPS GLP-1 is available. Brand new program for those of you taking a GLP-1. It's a workout. We'll help you with your diet, your supplements. Behavior modifications, it's the only workout program designed for people on a GLP-1 on the market. Of course, it's amazing. Because it's brand new, get it for $70 off, plus get two free eBooks. The first one is the ultimate medication guide for patients and practitioners. The second one is the intuitive nutrition guide. Go to mapsglp1.com, use the code GLP70, get $70 off, plus those free eBooks. Now, this episode is brought to you by a sponsor from our place. This is the first ever non-stick technology cast iron uh, dinnerware or cookingware, I should say, that's coating free, made without PFAs. These are known as forever chemicals. None of those are in these and they cook, they work so great. And you can put food, in, it's great. It cleans up easily too. Go check them out. Go to fromourplace.com and then use the code mind pump at checkout and get 10% off. All right, here comes the show. Lastly, uh, and this one is the number one reason, in my opinion, people get hurt when they start to pursue fitness goals. And if you look at the data on this, if you're not exercising now and you start exercising to try to improve your health and longevity, the odds are you probably will suffer from an injury within the first year or two. So in other words, a majority of you will suffer an injury. Now, the severity of the injury uh, varies. Nonetheless, nobody wants to get hurt. It sucks. And then, of course, it could stop you from exercising. It could stop the momentum. It's one of the number one reasons why people stop working out completely. So you don't want to hurt yourself. And the number one reason why people hurt themselves through exercise is, and I know what people are saying, people are working out wrong or they're using bad technique. Okay, that's 100% true. That's, that's the reason. But that's not the root reason. The root reason is that we view exercise as a means to an end. It's about sweating and getting sore. And we completely forget that it's all skills. Running is a skill. Uh, hiking is a skill, swimming is a skill, lifting weights is a skill, cycling is a skill. And like all skills, if you perform it poorly, you're, you're, you're going to suck at it. And in the case of physical skills, your chances or odds of injury go through the roof. So if I go to the gym and I think, and I'm going to go lift weights, and I'm all I think to myself is get my legs sore, then a squat and a leg press and a, and a lunge and a whatever is all a means to an end, get sore. The technique is really just, I'll watch the video and as long as you know, it's loosely follow it, then I'm going to be okay. No, not the case. Your, your chance of injury goes to the roof. Instead, if I look at it as if I was trying to learn a sport, 
And I said, well, all right, today I'm going to squat. Let me learn the skill of squatting. Let me practice the squat. Or I'm going to go start running. I haven't run since I was in fifth grade. I think I'd like to start running for exercise. You know, that's a skill. Let me learn how to run. Let me practice the skill of running. Let me train as if I'm trying to learn how to run properly. The odds of injury plummet versus the person who's just trying to get themselves tired. So my my brain also went a little bit different when I saw this point. And again, to your point, uh, I 100% agree. What I thought of was, you know, a, a mistake that people make is not embracing the fact that it, it, this is challenging and difficult and I need to practice it to get good at it like any other skill. And what came to mind for me was the mistakes that I, even I made as a young lifter, which was, oh man, I'm not very good at this squat thing, so I'm mm -hmm. just going to not do it. Oh, right. right. So I'm going to choose lesser exercises that I feel comfortable doing and I'd get in a machine in leg extension or leg press yeah. and not realizing how much I was leaving on the table and how much faster my results would have been had I just accepted that this squat exercise is really difficult and I'm not good at it, but that's okay because I'm just going to start at square one and practice it. I'm not going to worry about how much weight is on the barbell and get caught up in you know, the guy next to me who's doing four times my weight and let my ego get in the way. I'm going to just... I'm going to go practice it like the first day I picked up a basketball and I couldn't dribble a basketball, but I wanted to learn how to play. Or the first time I got into a pool and said, I've never learned how to swim. Let me learn the technique yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. And so embracing that learning curve of getting good at that craft and good at those movements that are going to give you the most ROI inside the gym. And so don't do that. Do not allow yourself to avoid the best movements just because you're not good at it or you don't like doing it. Embrace the fact that it is a challenging skill that you will need to practice and get good at because what's awesome is that once you do pick it up like any other skill, it gets fun and then the results, the return on investment start to compound. And I want to add practicing or trying to get good at a skill through the practicing process. Let's say you regress the exercise. You do other things to help yourself get in a position to do this new exercise or skill. Also give you great results. The process of getting that skill is also a great way to work out. In fact, this is how we train people. When we train people, the first, I don't know, six months oftentimes of their, of their training with us was us getting them to be able to do some big complex, you know, uh, complex skill type lifts, but that whole process, they're getting in shape. That whole process, they're feeling better. I mean, I, my brain kind of went in the same place you did, Adam, with this one. And, and back to your medical point, like this was always a fight when you would get a client that would come in and my right. doctor probably prefers me not to do deadlifts, not to do s yeah. anything where I'm loading my back. And, um, and, you know, and, and, to, to be able to work on that and to be able to work your way towards uh, the, the more high skill type lifts. And yes, compound lifts do require a bit more skill uh, than just, you know, sitting in a chair and doing a movement uh, with the machine. Uh, and so there is that bit of, uh, you know, uh, that, that gap, that, that, that learning curve that needs to happen, but the whole way there, you're going to get stronger and you're going to benefit your body just, uh, working your way towards that, that compound lift. So, uh, to, to completely dismiss it, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, and, it's, and, 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 it's like everything else in life that we, <laughs> that we learn, well, you know, you're, you're going to learn this either the, either you learn it from listening and applying it, or you're going to learn it the hard way that the, the secret sauce, the magic is in the journey. It's in like the best part of the squat is the process of getting good at the squat. And the best results come from that. The, all the benefits, the starting to eliminate back pain and hip issues and getting strong in the core and seeing body fat come off and muscle come on the body is in the journey of getting good at that movement. It's so much like everything else in our life. Yep. And to skip that or avoid that uh, is is such a mistake. Yeah, what's interesting too is all the, the, the most effective strength training exercises or some of the most common forms of exercise are not, now we will label them as high skill, but the reality is from a, a human perspective, from a human biomechanics perspective, these are all fundamental human movement, the, uh, movements that 
all bodies are, are should be capable of doing. Okay, yeah. so what we're not saying is you're going to do a backflip, you know, to a dumbbell snatch, or you're going to do, you know, just a crazy <laughs> you exercise, do overhead press, like circus, you know, type movements. No, no, no. it's like you're going to lift the weight and you're going to press it above your head with good, you know, good stability and strength and overhead press, or you're going to squat down with some weight. Um, across your shoulders, or you're going to lift something up off the floor, or you're going to push something off your body. Like these are all fundamental human movements. The fact, the, the reason why uh, people get hurt and the reason why people can't do them and have to learn them as a skill is just to, it, a testament to how far, how poor our health and mobility has become. So, what does that mean? Well, what I'm going to add to what you said, Adam, going from not being able to squat to being, being able to squat. Forget that you could squat a lot of weight, you're, you're moving, you know, you're super strong. Forget that. I couldn't squat before, now I can squat. Or I couldn't reach my arms overhead, now I can lift some weight straight up over my head. Or I couldn't lift things off the floor, now I can lift things off the floor. The difference in longevity is dramatic. From not being able to do fundamental human movement to being able to do fundamental human movement. So view all these things as important skills, practice them, don't work out, practice them over time, and then watch what happens to your health uh, and longevity. Look, if you love the show, find us on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano, and Adam's at Mind Pump Adam. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.